from Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Your source for the Department of Energy's environmental cleanup news. EnergyCast starts now. Hi everyone, I'm Summer Dash. Welcome to your March episode of EnergyCast. We have got some big changes coming to the show. This is going to be the last episode from my home studio. For almost two years, this has been our setup. It's a guest room in my house that we revamped into a TV studio. We had always hoped to grow, and with your viewership, we are so grateful to say we are moving on up in the world. We're going to share more behind the scenes looks at our current studio throughout this show, and then stick with us because we're going to be showing you some pictures of the new studio at the end of this episode, and you are not going to want to miss that. So, one final time from my house, let's get started with some energy bites. It's DOE's highest honor, and several of our coworkers can say they've earned it. We'll show you the importance of the Secretary Achievement Award and what teams across the reservation are doing that caught the eye of top leaders. And we are hearing from the new Oak Ridge City Manager. He's just a few weeks into his new role and brand new to the East Tennessee area. And you know, we've got a lot of acronyms around here to learn. I thought the other day when I finally caught myself and I said the EM people from DOE in reference to, in a, in a statement, I thought, oh my gosh, I've turned into one, one of us. So. so we're going to find out how he's getting up to speed and what he hopes to bring to the team. Well, anyway, there's been some ups and downs in here. There's probably ghosts in here. Billy Starnes has spent half a century working on the Oak Ridge Reservation. Imagine what he knows that we don't. We're getting a glimpse into the mind of the man who has been here since the 1970s. The Oak Ridge Regulatory and Community Engagement Team was just recognized by the Secretary of Energy for efforts on a long-running project. The achievement award they received is DOE's highest internal recognition. Sierra Hellemans has more about the award and how the team's success allows cleanup to keep moving forward. The saying goes, good things come to those who wait. But with EM's mission, it's more accurate to say the best results come through partnerships and persistence. A lot of folks don't realize, you know, we've been working on this overall concept of a new on-site disposal facility for over almost 13, 14 years. Years of planning and negotiations with state and federal regulators to come to a shared vision for the environmental management disposal facility. It was a marathon of an effort to uh, get through all of the process and the long uh, long-standing activities to reach an approved rod. That rod, or record of decision, was essential before work on EMDF could progress. Without EMDF, however, cleanup couldn't. Fortunately, the team found a way forward by focusing on the people involved. The leadership from DOE and UCOR reached out to the leadership from EPA in the state and, and uh, worked with them to come up with a new what we call partnership framework where we would all put the right people in the room to talk to each other. That framework is now a model for sites across the country. This group, we met, even during COVID, we met once a week, every week, for, you know, two or three years, and those meetings lasted anywhere from three to four hours at times. Those efforts and the results from all of that hard work were recognized last month at DOE's Honor Awards Ceremony in Washington, D.C. The event was great to be able to celebrate together is uh, really an important part of these types of moments where you kind of reflect on all the work you did and uh, we couldn't do it alone. We all did it together. Oak Ridge's regulatory and community engagement team was one of only six EM teams to earn the prestigious Secretary of Energy Achievement Award. Without their work to get the project approved, cleanup costs would increase by nearly a billion dollars and the pace would stall. It's good to see the recognition. Uh, it's also good to see the realization of how important this activity is. With the current disposal facility approaching capacity, EMDF enables cleanup for decades to come, and that cleanup is bringing opportunity. You know, we talk about 
uh, the future began, begins with cleanup. And so that cleanup that we're doing here not only removes environmental hazard, but it also generates footprint for new missions and supports new activities. So that's exciting. Reporting for EnergyCast, Sierra Hellemans. Now, because of their success, the EMDF project is moving forward. Crews are finishing early site prep, and now field work is underway for the next phase of the project. We're going to have more updates for you on that in future episodes. Oak Ridge employees are at it again. Figures coming in from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency show most of the nation's completed cleanup projects are happening right here. There are 175 federal cleanup sites nationwide. The Department of Defense, Department of Interior, and Department of Energy all have sites on that list. Now specifically, DOE's EM program has 15 sites on that total. The numbers for 2023 are in, and Oak Ridge accounted for 41% of all completed cleanup tasks across all federal sites. That's good for 67% of DOE's total. This adds to the already impressive numbers in recent years. From 2020 through 2022, Oak Ridge crews completed 61% of DOE's completed actions and 21% of all completed cleanup tasks nationwide. Leaders attribute the success to a skilled workforce, supportive community, and strong partnerships with regulators. Numerous area leaders recently traveled to the state capitol to attend the inaugural Nuclear and Innovative Energy Day in Nashville. The purpose was to raise awareness among state legislators about the recent growth and opportunities happening in East Tennessee through the nuclear industry. Representatives from ETEC, Oak Ridge National Laboratory, Y12, UCOR, TRISOX, Kairos, Roan State, and the University of Tennessee all attended. We spoke with Roan State President Chris Whaley at the event. It's good to be able to get the word out and let folks know about the great things that are going on in East Tennessee, all um, revolving around uh, uh, the nation's energy. The jobs are already here and the jobs are already needed uh, for the governmental entities and private companies and all of the partners that we work with who already need to hire folks. Uh, whether the you know whether the, the the emphasis is in chem tech or you know, then it will vary over into nuclear tech or environmental health. But that's only going to expand. And I think the confusion may come from the fact that it's going to get so much bigger and the need is going to be, get so much greater. But it's not like we're starting from zero. There is a need now, and it's only going to get, to get, get bigger. Trisuax and Kairos Power are two companies moving major operations to Oak Ridge and bringing hundreds of new jobs with them. We've been following the progress of those new endeavors here on EnergyCast. We will, of course, be continuing to keep you updated. The well, last year we covered EM's initiative to begin replacing its fleet with electric vehicles. Well, this year, let's just say EM and its contractor UCOR have their sights set on bigger goals and bigger vehicles, much bigger. Cameron Jacobs shows us. As UCOR continues pursuing sustainable work practices, the Heritage Center teams has identified a piece of equipment that will prove to be more energy and cost efficient in the field. Additionally, it offers enhanced safety features, and so far, operator feedback has been positive. UCOR is hopeful that equipment such as this will become part of its routine operations. Well, I've been uh, working with these electric equipment pieces, you know, what little bit that we can come up with. There's not a lot of stuff available, and so I hooked up with some guys from Power Equipment and one of our small vendors and uh, they had this machine available and asked if we was interested in demoing it. So uh, since it's electric in the swing and it has the, uh, the, uh, the electric part built into the swing, as it's swinging it's creating energy to send back to the machine and plus it's an electric motor so it's not making the engine work to do it therefore you're not burning no more fuel than you would be at an idle. The engine idle is about 700 RPMs less than normal. The reason I think it's amazing is because um, at times, and I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not using this um, holistically, but you get new technology and, and, and um, you say, here's the new technology, try it and like it. But this piece of technology, um, 
it enhances production, it embodies sustainability, and the workers like it. My background is in safety and health, and so I was standing next to someone else and I was saying, geez, you don't even have to have hearing protection because we can just talk in a normal tone and, and, and hear each other. With positive results from this recent demonstration, UCOR is working with its equipment vendor to have hybrid machines added to its fleet. For EnergyCast, I'm Cameron Jacobs. There's a lot to build on there, but I, I think it needs more for critical mass. Uh, and I also think that that will create a place where younger people will want to move here. Just ahead, we are sitting down with the new Oak Ridge City Manager. We'll take a look at his experience before the big move to East Tennessee and find out how he's adjusting to the new job and new surroundings. Well, these are my co-workers on days when I record this show. Did you know the current EnergyCast studio is in my house? <laughs> this temporary set has served us so well, but we are thrilled to be moving into a real studio in Oak Ridge. We're going to be able to bring guests in for interviews and better communicate important EM news to all of you. And we are getting closer to the big reveal at the end of this episode. the five big stories happening across the complex right now, we are bringing you major EM news from coast to coast. The Savannah Riverside hit a major milestone. Employees there have processed more than 15 million gallons of radioactive salt waste. That work began in 2008 and the site is steadily eliminating the 33 million gallons of liquid radioactive waste stored in tanks. At the West Valley site, teams safely demolished the waste reduction and packaging area. The structures were previously used during spent nuclear fuel processing operations. The teardown began in January and its completion positions the site for the next phase of cleanup. EM issued a request for information to identify industry partners interested in developing clean energy projects on DOE land in southeast New Mexico. It is part of the Clean Up to Clean Energy initiative. DOE identified 9,000 acres available near the waste isolation pilot plant. Comments must be submitted by March 20th. EM has awarded the Hanford Integrated Tank Disposition Contract. It goes to Hanford Tank Waste Operations and Closure LLC, or H2C, of Lynchburg, Virginia. The contract has a maximum value of $45 billion over a 10-year period. Now, work under the contract includes operating tank farm facilities and designing and constructing and operating waste treatment facilities. EM hosted a first-of-its-kind discussion in Denver, Colorado that brought together representatives from 11 tribes whose ancestors occupied land where cleanup sites are now located. Those conversations focused on improving protection and the ability for tribal people to use and access the sacred sites. EM has six field offices with cooperative agreements to support tribal involvement. The new Oak Ridge city manager is officially in office. In fact, we headed to his new digs to see how he is adjusting to the position and the area. Here's a bit of our talk with Randy Heeman. I've focused my whole career on uh, economic development type issues. Got to build a baseball stadium in High Point, do some downtown development and a lot of those things. So, and, and even some tech type stuff. Uh, I uh, was on a board called the Digital Engineering Institute in Mooresville that was w looking at ways to advance digital engineering and, and make some uh, connections between industries there and uh, some of the resources that we had for digital engineering. What do you think are some of your priorities and have they changed at all now that you have gotten acclimated here? You, you know, a big priority for me will be to continue to listen to folks that work over at DOE. I am really interested in knowing, you know, and, and this will sound a little corny, but to me it's very important that Oak Ridge create a great quality of life for folks that are doing important work for this country. And I know that sounds weird, but it's really the way I feel. 
and I'm interested in hearing more about, you know, we've got fantastic schools, we've got fantastic parks and recreation, we lack the housing opportunities. I'm anxious to hear what other people want to see, whether it's retail, and I know that we need to develop a food scene and some bars and some things that would attract younger uh, people. If you're, you've got school age kids, you're gonna want to be here because of the school system is just so fantastic. But you know, to, to listen to what does the, the community want and need and then try to provide that is really gonna be uh, my focus and, and always on continual service improvement. You know, I think our, our staff here does a fantastic job, but there's always room to do more and, and better. There is a lot more from that conversation. Specifically, he delves into his vision for Oak Ridge, talking about restaurants, bars, coffee shops, to create a more bustling social scene for the many people moving here for work. We're going to have an energy extra for you with Randy Heeman in the coming weeks. That's where we take a topic from this show, go even more in depth online. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, X, and YouTube to find this energy extra. So. I took two, two weeks off and went to work for isotate. Does that really count as retirement? <laughs> Not much. <laughs> we are thrilled to be celebrating a milestone work anniversary on this episode of Energy Cast. Billy Starnes was 26 when he first headed to work at Building 3019 at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Some say no one alive knows more about that facility than he does. Coming up, we'll sit down with this legend as he recalls half a century right there. And you know, the only downside is that I won't be able to wear pajama pants while I host this show anymore. EnergyCast is moving out of my house, kicking it out. Our brand new studio will be up and running come May. We are going to share more details with you and reveal what it looks like in just a few minutes. years in one building. Imagine that. One Isotec employee has been heading to work in building 3019 since 1974. We met up with him in the control room where he spent hours every day as a new employee. These days the work looks different, but it's the purpose that has kept him showing up. One of the first things the supervisor said to me, uh, you look like you could wear a, a gas mask. And yeah, I could. I'd been taught in the Navy. When Billy Starnes first walked into this World War II era building. I was probably so happy to have a job that didn't, didn't register how many times you're going to be in them. He'll tell you he was just looking for a paycheck. Yeah. He spent a lot of time in this very spot earning it. It's the control room of the oldest operating nuclear facility in the world. I started here on February the 4th, 1974, in this building. Today, this is mostly just a meeting space. The buttons and knobs on the walls are simply an ode to the past. This was a five-day, 24 hours a day, rotating shift type operation in here. All these little units were running. At that time, though, building 3019 was a pilot plant. Employees here were testing radiochemical processes, specifically working with uranium-233. I was one of the first engineering technicians they brought in when they started ramping up the number of people to really go into production. It was created as an alternative nuclear fuel source, but would later be determined too difficult to use. What were some of the most meaningful moments spent here for you? Wow. Wow. Um. In the early days, um, you know, it looked like we were making a lot of progress from production and shipping, and there was some other materials that were stored here for many years, and those were solidified, canned up, welded up, stored. Um, it was, there was a, a lot of projects going on that, uh, you know, had, had meaning, and there was an accomplishment to finish those. Eventually, the nation's entire stockpile of U-233 was sent here for storage. A lot of the small users were shipping their materials back. So at the end of 2003, I retired from ORNL and UTB 
And since this Isotec project was oncoming, it looked like a natural. So I took two, to, two weeks off and went to work for Isotec. Does that really count as retirement? <laughs> Not much. <laughs> he came for a paycheck, but stayed for a purpose. To separate out the thorium-229 for medical isotope. And it sounded like a very good thing that should be done to the material since it had been here so many years and, you know, so it just looked like the thing to do. Uranium-233 and its new use in cancer treatment pulled him back. I swear, he says he doesn't remember, but there's an remember. instrument up there. Billy could rattle off this five-digit number off the top of his head with what instrument that is. He still, that, that level of knowledge that he retains on that's incredible. And thank goodness it did. I still call him probably at least on a weekly basis to Billy, do you remember that drawing for this? Some of these co-workers have been with him for decades, while others are just starting out. But no matter who you ask. And look at the people's names, and he remembers what their roles were. <laughs> oh, he was a pipe fitter. He was this. She was that. He can remember. It's just... He's so focused not only on the technical details, he focused on the people details. Starnes is the real treasure here. Well, just a cost perspective, just the, having that somebody that valuable on the project is it's hard to calculate how what how important that is. He may as well be the Google search engine of this place. I think I've been in pretty much every compartment, every cell, every tunnel, even into the bottom of the stack. So yeah, I've probably seen a few of the places that most people have not seen or will not see. That's what makes him exceptional at his latest responsibility as a tour guide. There's a lot of old pictures that are still around that we have access to. He'll share his stories, all 50 years worth of them, and if you're lucky, a secret too. There's probably ghosts in here. In fact, we tried to get one final out of him. Do you have plans to retire? Um, not that I've told anyone. Am I about to get an exclusive? No. But that's just one more bit of information only Billy knows. One thing is certain, when he leaves this place for good, a piece of history walks out too. <laughs> The annual Waste Management Symposia brings together industry leaders from all around the world. Nearly 3,000 people attended this year's event from more than 30 countries. And that event too, by the way, also celebrating 50 years. Oak Ridge took the stage and shared how cleanup has changed the site over that span. Take a look. So the big deal was, you know, enriching uranium isotopes and many other supporting activities were going on here at the site. But we were cognizant of the fact that we had to deal with the materials that we were making and the waste that were generated. Cleanup operations kicked into high gear in the 1980s when operations at the Oak Ridge K-25 site were halted. Uranium enrichment ceased in 1985 and site operations were permanently shut down in 1987, leaving millions of square feet of unneeded contaminated buildings as its legacy. It appeared that there was not a very deliberate process for shutting things down. And so a lot of what we have dealt with here in Oak Ridge uh, in the EM program has actually been a result of that because you left materials in process. So there was a lot of that kind of work before the work that had to be done before you could ever get to tearing the place down. The 1990s brought more direction and guidance on cleanup efforts. A federal facility agreement was established in 1992 among DOE, EPA, and the Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation with the latter two as regulators for cleanup and waste management efforts. The big focus back then really was on waste management because you had waste you had to deal with and then getting all the regulatory documents in place to actually be able to do the cleanup. So a number of years were spent not doing a tremendous amount of cleanup, but doing a lot of regulatory document work to allow the cleanup to occur. In the early 2000s, the Environmental Management Waste Management Facility was built, providing a safe, 
local, and cost-effective disposal option for building debris that was not highly contaminated. Also, the private eight-mile haul road was built, giving a direct path for trucks without driving debris through town. So it enabled these facilities that were no longer needed to be disposed of safely and securely without any environmental insult. You know, without shipping things way across the country and the costs going out, of, out the roof. From 2006 to 2011, demolition activities were happening across the ETTP site, including removal of the K-29 building and initiation of demolition on the massive K-25 building. When UCOR took over cleanup operations in 2011, more than 7 million square feet of buildings were demolished. Here we ended up delivering, you know, four years ahead of schedule, 80 to 90 million dollars under budget. It was the first gaseous diffusion plant site in the world to be cleaned up. So, you know, that to me is one of the big success stories. Reindustrialization is closely connected with the EM mission. Croat, which began in 1995, is a local nonprofit that receives building and property transfers from federal ownership at ETTP and then reuses those assets to attract new industry to the site that will benefit the community economically. The reindustrialization of ETTP is at the core of everything that we're trying to do around the reservation and economic development. We couldn't give the land away. Like it just sat empty for a long time. Vision 2020 happens, the last building comes down, and the site just looked and felt different. And all of a sudden, there was a demand for the property, and organically, we're the home of the nuclear renaissance. So not only is the property getting used and beneficially reused, but in a way that benefits the nation and the world. Today, the many lessons learned from the gaseous diffusion cleanup are being used at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory and the Y-12 National Security Complex, reducing risks and allowing beneficial reuse of restored footprints for crucial science and defense missions. We just looked at the past 50 years and now EM is planning for the next 50. Recruitment and workforce development efforts were at an all-time high over the past year. That resulted in 260 new hires. Many filled vacant roles while other offices saw growth. That brings EM's total number of employees to 1,260 at headquarters and its 15 sites nationwide. We wanted to share some of the most notable trends over that span. Veterans account for 28% of EM's workforce with 35 new additions. That focus landed DOE as the top veteran employer, according to Forbes. EM is also adding more early career employees to prepare for future work. The office increased representation of the 25 through 34 age group by 28 employees. It also filled all 40 positions in the Pathways recent graduate program. Nearly 40% of new hires are women, and a notable 47% are people with disabilities. Well, we've got something very big in the works, as you well know if you've watched this far. EnergyCast is moving to a brand new studio, from my home to our new home. We promised to give you a sneak peek at the new set, so are you ready? Three, two, one. We've been working on this project for months and we are so excited to finally get to share it with you. The new space has a news anchor desk. Right now, I'm sitting on a bar stool from our upstairs loft. <laughs> You'll see a big touch screen monitor where we can take you through the sites and interact with you on social media. Plus, there's a beautiful and inviting interview set where we'll be talking through some of the major challenges, updates, and achievements to come. This studio, will enable us to better communicate our message to lawmakers, industry professionals, and our community. Our mission to tell the stories of the important work happening across the Oak Ridge Reservation stays the same. It'll all just look a little bit fancier. And while I have loved welcoming you into my home every month, I am so excited for our new studio. And I'm really looking forward to getting this guest room in my house back. So thank you for joining us for EnergyCast from day one. 
New episodes are still going to come out monthly, but the format of the show is changing right along with the look. This means there won't be an episode in April as we do prepare to launch that new show, but we'd love to take you along with us as we get ready. So be sure to follow us on our social media accounts. We're going to be posting more behind the scenes videos and pictures on our Facebook, Instagram, and X accounts as we get settled into our new EnergyCast home. You'll still be able to watch the new version on air and online. We appreciate every single one of you who has trusted us with your story over the last two years. You have made our jobs so rewarding. We know we wouldn't be at this exciting turning point without you. So it has been a privilege bringing you the news from my home. I will see you in May from the new EnergyCast studio in Oak Ridge.